Thank you. Thank you again, Karim. Thank you, Amanda. Yes. And thank you, everyone, again. I have my questions here. And my first question is for you, PJ. But if you want to share some words before. I started moving my steps in the design community more than in the furniture industry, right? In the design community lately. And, and my dream was to take Natuzzi in this beautiful community and for this community to love the brand, to get to know the brand and to feel the passion and the vision that there's behind it. So the fact that tonight I can sense some love, I can sense your presence, and possibly I'll be able to share how the evolution is taking part in place is a real honor and makes my heart full of good, good energy. So thank you again. And I would like to add that uh, just quickly, I met PJ's father in High Point, North Carolina in 1997. Now, PJ was like this. Oh, you were a little taller. And Natuzzi built a very contemporary showroom building, a substantial building in a very sleepy, backward American town. So you imagine I came to Milan and I studied in Naples design and I came to Milan and worked in a design studio here back in 1984. And I went back to Toronto where I was, I was brought up in England and Toronto. I come back to Toronto. And by the 90s, when I decided to move to New York, early 90s, and open my own office, I was looking for projects. So I went down to High Point, North Carolina, and I saw furniture that I didn't even know still was produced. I know that's very critical, but it was very, very traditional, relatively backward. And there were very few contemporary companies there. So then all of a sudden, it's 1997, I'm down in High Point, and I see this inauguration of this beautiful building. I wasn't invited, so I managed to squeeze my way in. Remember, I tell your father, is your father here? He just passed by. Pasquale yeah. Sr., you didn't invite me. <laughs> I walked in. And I saw Pasquale cutting the ribbon with his children. It was quite beautiful. And I went, wow, this is a turning point in the United States that I could see a turning point going from this traditional, which is really comes from England and uh, Ireland, Scotland, that history, turning point to contemporary, which was the Italian wave, obviously, which started in the late 60s. After you opened your building, one company after another slowly started to enter high point. That's how I think important and pivotal Natuzzi was then. And now we're celebrating 65 years of Natuzzi. Long way, long way here. A long way. Uh, and, uh, and I worked with Pasquale Sr. 20 years ago, and he told me all my ideas were too radical, like many companies have over the years. You know who you are. And finally, this year, in fact, how did we meet? We were in New York when we... we oh, oh, yeah, we I came chatting. to Natuzzi opening last year in New York. Yes, at ICFF, and we chatted, and we started a collaboration, and PJ is much better to work with than his father. Um, <laughs> Don't say that. Wow. He's going to kill us from, from the balcony. <laughs> he's going to shoot us. Dove, Louis? He's, he's here. I s just saw him somewhere. Anyways, Amanda, please. Sorry. Amanda. PJ, how was Natuzzi being adapting its furniture exhibition strategy, uh, transitioning from its traditional focus on events like Salone del Mobile in Milan to more intimate gatherings held in, in the stores with the aim of accentuating the brand's identity? The idea of Natuzzi has always been related to, of course, taking the brand on a consumer level closer to the people, opening stores, opening venues. Already, this started in the late 90s. So in the early 2000s, we were opening showrooms in the world because our aim was to get closer to the people and perhaps even jumping the world of interior decorators and architects. We were providing back then already the service to the consumers of the world. In the last 15, I would say 15, 20 years, but in the last 10 years, we understood and we transformed from a sofa company into a transforming spaces company, right? And our connection with the design community, our aim to be more and more relevant and in the mind and in the soul of designers and interior decorators took place in this store over the last years because it became more and more a place in which the relationship is less fast 
and rapid and perhaps superficial like it can be an affair where you walk in and you work out but this is we feel it more like our home yeah and it's really our home all year long because this is our flagship so we had you know the goal of creating experiences in these stores together event people. like this kind hosting bad people like mr fabio november there and creating a community of friends that know that we're here waiting for them that our sense of mediterranean hospitality can take place in a venue where it's stable it's more dense and it's more rooted in the soil of a city like Milan that today is showing a lot of value aside from a beautiful event like Salone which always will be crucial but I feel that being able to transmit the values of a brand in a more direct way in your own stores is something that if a brand can do it should do it. Considering Natuzzi's collaboration with a variety of designers such as Karim Hashid who boosts diversified portfolios spanning different scales beyond just furniture? How do you perceive the dynamics of these partnerships? It might sound weird, but uh, my intention while pursuing a collaboration with a designer is always to find the most, the most diverse DNAs. If you look at Karim's work and Karim's uh, design identity, you really see something that is pretty far from perhaps how you perceive the Tutsi. And I think that this is what makes the collaboration magical because it's by blending. I always say that if you blend water and water, you're only going to get water. If you blend different substances, then, you know, magic can come out. And so my pursuit, my research is to find diverse DNAs, creative identities that can blend and interpret Natuzzi with new eyes. So it's really the idea of evolving a brand through others' perspective on how to evolve and innovate our heritage, which has, you know, history and roots long 65 years. So if Karim comes on board and gives his own color scheme, his own idea of shapes, of design, of how to stretch the DNA, all of a sudden the brand becomes kind of three-dimensional, yeah. you know? Karim, when did you first recognize your exceptionally creative nature? And furthermore, do you believe creativity primarily derives from inspirations or discipline effort? First, I'll say that everybody here is creative. It's human nature to create. And 99% of humanity is given the intellect, the power, the brain, knowledge to be able to do something creative, a creative act. A good example of that is Every one of you, when you were a child, you drew, you painted, you imagined, you created your own little stories and narratives, and you were as Mauro Puccini. Do, where is Mauro? Mauro. Do I say? Ah. Okay, I'm not going to quote Mauro Puccini then. He used a word many years ago, many times, curious, curiosity. It's a big word in Italy. And when you're a child, you're so curious because you're absorbing information constantly. And everything you see, because it's the first time you're seeing it or engaging it, you're imagining creating a world that we're not even really aware of. We have not been able to go into a three or four year old child and examine what and how they're really thinking. But they're thinking in a creative aspect, meaning that we are born to create. I always say this, we are born on this earth, all of us to create. And we're all capable of original creation. And with that said, being capable of original creation means that we expect or would like to live in a creative context. Um, who's these people interrupting us? The audacity, <laughs> bloody audacity you have, Fabio. Okay, so you know who just joined us? Two very good friends that I've known for 30 years. Ron Arad, everybody. Um, and by the way, Ron sleeps in that hat. And Fabio Novembre, a beautiful man who, you know, 20 years ago, he and Ora Ito cornered me at a dinner and they said to me, what's wrong with you? And I said, what do you mean what's wrong with me? And they said, you do too much. Record request, what? You do too much. You know, you're just doing too much. And, uh, and Ora Ito was determined and Fabio was determined. So I thought about it and I said, well, you know what I do? I'm so passionate to create and to do things 
that I guess in a way I take almost on any opportunity that comes to me. I am the design whore, I told them, <laughs> right? And uh, you remember that story, that conversation? So <laughs> with that said, what I realize is I watched Fabio's career over the years. I watched Orido, who's done beautiful work. They do a lot too. We do a lot, and I'll just go back to this, and Ron, we do a lot because, as I said about all of us, we all need and have to create. And I will tell you, the number one way of remedying depression and a lot of mental illnesses is creation. So isn't it interesting that our DNA is pushing us to do this? But what happens to all of us at some point? At some point, usually it's a turning point, five, six, seven years old, society, our parents, our peers, the teachers, um, suppress this creativity in us. And next thing you know, we start growing and forgetting that our reason to be on this planet is to contribute and create to humanity. And that's all that design is. I always try to figure out what the definition of design is. Design is about working with contemporary context, contemporary criteria to shape the future. As designers, we actually inspire and shape the future. And then going back to PJ, what he just said earlier, you know, when I came on board with PJ is, sure, I have a different DNA, I should, and we all should. So if you take 10 people in a room, ideally like when they were children, they will all paint differently. Designers, architects, we should all be contributing differently. And what is your personal experience with that? Do you feel that you have ever been, have like had your creativity surpassed? Suppressed? Creativity suppressed? Yes. I don't mean this in a braggarty way, but I find I have way more ideas than I have clients. Okay. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> you know what's interesting about being in a creative process? If you're doing little, you accomplish little. And what I mean by that is the brain is not working at a certain speed. It's like playing video games. If you play video games for 10 years, it's amazing the speed of synapses that goes through the brain and how quick your reflexes are, etc. I find that with creativity. If I've got 10 projects to create, I find myself being super creative, meaning that I'm in the modus operandi to create. So I can remember when I'm in university, you imagine you're given one project and you have six months to accomplish it. Next thing you know, the world we live in now with the speed we live in now, which actually is a bit of a detriment, the speed is you have very little time to create with a lot of brands and companies because what they have is immediate deadlines. And there was a time, and I remember in my profession, the 80s, 90s, where there was a lot of time given and a lot of prototypes built and a lot of reflection and a lot of discussion onward to get to a final result. Today, it's sort of immediate. But the good thing about that is, is then if we're all in that sort of spirit of immediacy, we actually start to become more creative. And it's like I always say, you know, when people have constraints, a lot of designers, they complain, oh, I got, you know, there's too many constraints, is this, that. That is the opportunity to be really creative. So we should look at constraints and problems as creativity. When I work with Natuzzi, that's a, a kind of a nice example, actually, to come back to. There are constraints to work with Natuzzi, no question about it. Like, even worse, every automotive designer that complains to me weekly on Instagram about how they hate their job, there's so many constraints in that business that it's almost becoming uncreative. So my immediate reaction to it is find it within that the opportunity for creation, even if it's nuance. And it's a little bit like saying if every one of us are capable of an original act, which by the way, we are, and everything are in this earth at some point was original, an original thought by someone, which I always find amazing that original thought. If we're all capable of original thought, we can create something original. Every one of us is capable. The difficulty is because the world is becoming very saturated with a lot of things. It starts to become harder and harder and harder to do something original. Then what you need to do is find within that project the nuance of the originality because there's always something there that you can progress and evolve that archetype. PJ, what is your strategic outlook for the future of Natuzzi, particularly in light of its collaborations with a diverse array of designers? And where do you envision Natuzzi heading with these collaborations? Like I said, my aim is to create a brand that harmonizes not only ambience and spaces with its own products, but also delivers to 
client this sense of harmony in this sense of place but creates harmony while leveraging on this creative diversity and creating new newness for products and creativity to have a brand that all of a sudden will represent with great coherence throughout all the brand levers represent a, a pure and unique and unified identity right so over the last 20 year, if you ask in this room, and if you ask Ron, and you ask Fabio, Karim, or someone else in this room, what's your perception of Natuzzi? They might give you four different answers, right? So first of all, my aim is to keep on evolving the brand with coherence throughout all its levers of presentation, in coherence globally, so that whenever a designer or a customer walks into a Natuzzi store, feels He's getting into the home of a brand that has a clear identity and it doesn't, you know, vary too much. So to make that happen, our collections, our stores, our identity has to be more and more refined and clear and connecting all of the elements that, you know, a pulse in the brand's blood on one end. So designer will be crucial to keep on evolving creativity and give it an image that not only helps us, in creating a whole new standard of creativity within the collection, but also helps us connecting with, you know, interior decorators, with the design community, because I think that designers aren't a good medium. You know, there's a lot of people in the room tonight. He said, you must be good looking. I said, no, I'm, I'm not. You're famous, you know. I know my friendship with these great people is not intended to leverage their being notorious and having people on their behalf or thanks to them. It is because they give value to the thinking, to the design thinking, to the soul of the brand. They add every little time we co-create, they add fresh blood, they add vision, they add dreams. So to me, it's a way of making the brand active, dynamic, inclusive, and making the brand alive. And it can't stay alive if we keep ourselves enclosed in our own world, but it will be passionate and alive if we also live by gathering passion on all of the branches that this huge Natuzzi olive tree can extend, you know? Yeah. That's a nice analogy. I like that. And Karim, in your perspective, what are the subtle distinctions between designing furniture tailored to enhance people's experience and comfort compared to conceptualizing other types of projects, objects? Let's talk about design for a moment. What we don't talk about in design is how every physical and now virtual thing in our daily lives has a huge impact and effect on our mental well-being, right? Everything. When PJ told me about a kind of a philosophy of Natuzzi was circle of harmony. It was a nice word, actually, a nice phrase, because harmony for me is beauty. What I see on the surface, if I look at that table and if someone said, oh, that table is beautiful, my feeling is if it is beautiful, it's because within it is some real content. There's an idea or a concept, an ideology, something to say, not just the surface of it. I always say this, I define beauty that way, inner and outer being harmonious. So in industrial design or design, what it takes to make something beautiful is so dependent on the production method the craft or artisans that are involved, if they are, the machinery, the tooling, the material, the final finish. There's a lot that impacts and can make something beautiful or not beautiful, right? But we tend to have a tendency, the world has become a little bit very image driven. I love this fact and I checked it the other day to make sure I'm right. 1.47 billion images a day now are up in the cloud, right? The cloud's getting really heavy. Hey, Pazante, questo... Uh, Right? It's crazy. So here we are taking a couple of pictures thinking, oh, you know, at 1.47 billion. So we are so image driven that we start to look at an object or a thing in 2D. First of all, we're, we're seeing so much of the world in 2D, which is strange because our technology has afforded us a 4D world now, but somehow we're still quite flat. And then we're starting to see everything just visually. So I even had an argument the other day that people somehow think that design is visual. No, design is all of it. It's experience. tactorial, experiential, sensorial. It's sound, it's smell, 
it's taste. This is all part of the human experience. And that's what design is. And you see how design is maturing to the point where, do you remember a few years ago, there was like a Milan fair was all about food. Why was it about food? A lot of people just had a disconnect. Well, what does food have to do with design? It's not about the food itself. It's about using our senses and stimulating our senses to make a sort of better world, a more beautiful, harmonious world. And that goes back to that circle of harmony. Another thing I just want to add to that is circle of harmony, which is really nice. It's about gathering, bringing people together. Why do we want to bring people together? Because we're becoming so virtual that we have a primordial human need to get together. And I remember two years ago at the Milan Fair when it was in like June. Do you remember yes. that? That was a weird thing. It was sort of empty here, very strange because it was post-COVID. And people were longing for these trade shows and people were longing to like talk to each other again or hug and kiss, which was a mistake, or, you know, shake hands because it's primordial desire, right? So now gathering, like when I look at this space, which is very interesting, I was saying that the couch, for example, in the 1700s, most couches were built like a half or three quarter circles because you would have discussion, discourse, right? So that's the way they were folded. We moved into early modernism, Verkbund, Bauhaus, et cetera, et cetera, and it became straight. And when it became straight, we said, oh, well, how do we talk to people? Because you can't talk like this. It's like when you're in a restaurant, or no, you're in a party, and there's a dining table with 40 people on one long rectangle. You don't get to talk to anybody except left, right, and front. You're gathering like this, but when the couch went this way, they said, oh, we need another couch. So you put another couch on the opposite side with a coffee table. Usually the coffee table, the problematic thing is like this, so you can't even reach it. It's very funny in, in meetings, or in, in lobbies. Everybody's, everybody's. Oh, yes. We need to observe social human behaviors to design good things, right? And then we got rid of the second couch because we put the television. And even this sort of behavior, the TV was low because it was on a stand. All of a sudden it's on the wall, it's higher. So people are more like that. So now the couch starts to get deeper and you can see the evolution. But it's the same reason why in New York, the style of the pant was coming down to here, walking around showing your bottom. You know why, right? Because the jails in Texas, they don't allow you to have a belt in case you hang yourself. Everything in our world is derived, believe it or not, from a function. Yeah. Everything. And then eventually it becomes superfluous style. So then the TV's there. Now, guess what? There's no TV. So there's the phone, the iPad. Next thing you know, I'm talking, you know, we're here and maybe PJ and I are talking, but we have iPads in front of us, maybe. Next thing you know, we're going to have the Apple goggles on. So it doesn't matter if PJ's in front of me or not. But what ha starts to happen is we're going back to the gathering. So the couches are starting to go round again. And you'll even start to see proposals. And if you look in the late 60s, which is still as a child, I, my memory of this stuff, every house I went to, this living room was sunken and they were round couches or squares because it was all about basically swapping wives. And uh, did everybody get my joke? That's what it was about. Nobody laughed here. <laughs> there was a bowl like that with everybody's keys. You come to a party and there's a bowl. Everybody puts their keys and then a woman would go pick a set of keys and whatever keys she got, she has to sleep with that man that night. That was the 1960s, by the way. Anyway, going back to that. So here we are now. Now, even now with Fabio, I have a view of him and I can talk to him because this thing has already gotten started curving. And if you look at trend, everybody out there, you're starting to see a curve slightly. Cow. But we're a little bit, what's the word? Contrived. Because we don't want to curve it too much. Why don't we want to curve it too much? Maybe it takes up too much room. You know, you need a big living. I don't know. But this is the trend that's starting to like, and now we're starting to like talk to each other. And this is what the world will go back to. My next question will be perfect because I was going to ask you about your experience with the design of this sofa. I believe we have uh, such a maestro in the room. You know, I think Ron is the design father of all of us. And having Ron here is such a luxury, such a, a luck that, you know, I would like to hear from him as well, you know, I mean, because his experience is far longer than ours. I really, anything you will say for me, it's illuminating. So Ron, please, Ron, don't be an ageist. Yeah. I Hey, hold it. I mean, like, I just remember once when I landed in Toronto for the first time, I didn't know anyone there, and there was a, a tall boy waiting for me, someone I didn't know, and introduced himself. I'm Karim Rashid, and I will look after, I mean, I'll guide you here in Toronto. And not only that, he gave me a hat. Not and that one, but another one. No, 
Of course not that one. That's the, yeah. That's your hat. That's a good one. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It, this is not working either. Yeah, but w what do you want me to say, Fabio? Whatever you will say, it's interesting for the audience. Whatever. You can also tell a joke, whatever you want. I think, I can, I think Oscar Wilde summed it the best way about people. And I can say the same thing about objects. There's only two types of people in the world. Tedious people and charming people. And I say the same thing about objects. There's interesting, delightful objects and boring objects. Sadly, most of them are boring and tedious. Luckily, some of them are exciting and we can analyze and I don't think you talked about how difficult it is to be original. It's not at all. It's not the problem. Speaking for myself, I mean, the only thing, well, curiosity is, is the drive. You're curious. What would happen if I do this? What happen if I don't do this? And your curiosity drives what you do. If you're lucky, other people are also curious about what you do and you can make a living. What am I saying here? Why am I here? <laughs> You, you already said super wise things, you know what I mean? I mean, let's go to simplicity, that was amazing. Yeah. No, seriously, yeah. using Oscar Wilde as a metaphor for objects is quite interesting. I used Oscar Wilde recently on a piece that I did. It's because I did a piece of mine sold at an auction at uh, Philips. It's a prototype that I made and it was sold for a science fiction record price. When a piece of yours sells, if you're an artist, sells in an auction, there's what is called artist's right or what is we've got. And the artist gets a small percentage, but not if you can put your ass on it. Because the piece was functional and it was designed, although it broke the records of Philips at the time, they thought they don't have to pay the artist anything. And that is also, I can go back to Oscar Wilde, he thought, trying to define art, that art should not be functional. I did a piece that I showed recently called Not Carved in Stone. Mm. It was carved in stone. It was a piece of marble by a company called Chitko from Verona. And I recommend the best thing in this, for me in the Fiara is the stand. All 13 D10 Chitko. And I saw for the first time a piece that I worked on recently, but I only saw it when I got there. So I wrote about not carved in stone, I, a quote that says, art is quite useless. A work of art is as useless as a flower is useless. Oscar Wilde, the same guy that gave me the sentence I liked, also gave me the sentence that I liked to dislike. Quite honestly, I didn't expect that. <laughs> and if he didn't use force, this guy, you would have to listen to me now. <laughs> Okay. I would love to know more, Karin, about your experience when you approached to design a product such a significant scale for Natuzi, like the sofa. How did you approach and tackle this challenge? I mean, have already talked about this amazing evolution of how sofa evolved, but how was your personal experience with, in this scale? When you approach a project, you know, Ron talked about art, versus design. It's a long subject, right? It's been gone on a controversy of that subject for hundreds of years, actually, right? Is that you have criteria and every design project has completely different criteria. And some projects afford you to be very liberal and very more so creative, let's say, or more that you bring in your own criteria or your own, however, whatever discourse you want to have. You can make an object that speaks politically, socially, creatively, economically. There's a lot of different ways to speak about a product. But the reality is, is that, you know, Natuzzi sells good design, right? Contemporary design and commercial design. So there's criteria there to fit within that constraints. And then you have a creative person, you decide whether you can work or fit in that or not. You know, there's certain brands that are very difficult to fit into. There's other ones that are, are different. So when I worked with, with Natuzzi, I have to understand their culture. I have to understand the brand well. I have to understand, you know, what they do, how they do it, what they make, you know, and all that, which I already knew because I actually designed for Natuzzi 20 years ago, but nothing was produced, but I've watched them over the years. The part I always liked about them is they managed to make contemporary design a kind of uh, a global, a more accessible, I should say too. 
global affordable and accessible model around the world. So that was a big outreach because a lot of Italian companies who have done great things never could get to that level of expansion or reach that level of audience. I will say though, I just want to go back to the issue of art and design is, and I've thought a lot about this a lot. In 40 years I've been designing, some projects I can almost act as an artist and other projects I'm almost in, put in a position of being a service industry. And it's really difficult because if you move towards the service industry, you're actually, you have no personal contribution. And if you move towards the other part of the pendulum and you're in the art, it's, you're, there's a freedom and a selfishness, really. You know, I, I always say this, artists here, here hate me saying this, but artists are selfish. I watch my father get up every morning and paint and do whatever he liked. It's a very selfish act. Design, on the other hand, you have so many people. You're like a conductor. You have so many people to, to Think conduct. Of. You know? You yeah. Have, you have a lot of players. Yeah. So it depends on the projects, obviously. This mm -hmm. is, they're all very, very, very different. And aside from your futuristic design ethos, what other influences or aspirations did you incorporate into the design of Tantuzi Sofa? How did you navigate and synthesize, synthesize these diverse influences to create an innovative yet cohesive product that resonates with the brand's clientele? I think for me, what's important is, is just to actually do something that people would enjoy to live with, but also very critical is that it's highest comfort level. I'm a bit obsessed with that. And I'm also an obsessed with softness. You know, I think in the last 20 years I made 200 sofas and I've never put any legs on any of them as an example. This sort of amorphosis, this sort of softness is for me a way that you can actually ha not have obstacles in your life. I see obstacles, I see objects as a detriment to a good life. I see a lot of things in our world as they're sort of in the way. Like this microphone is in the way of me, you know, it's an obstacle and it affords me to end up talking in a certain way that ideally I probably wouldn't have talked if I didn't have it in front of me. So the world is full of obstacles. And there's a Jean Baudrillard was beautiful. It was Baudrillard that said this, something like that everything in front of us has a reason to exist. It exists if it's providing us a better life and a better experience. And if not, it's becoming a detriment. It's an obstacle. So you make a couch simple, nothing, nothing really radical, really but you just do the lines the right way, keep the comfort the right way, the soft is the right way. And then, you know, the reality is, and this is design, it ends up in a lot of people's homes. That's a question of where the designer wants to take their work. Do they want to actually touch a lot of people's lives or they, do they want to touch a few people's lives, you know? And I've always been a bit biased to wanting to touch a lot of people's lives. That's my raison d'etre. And my final question for you, PJ, uh, well, considering uh, Brazil's strong affinity for Italian design, how does Natuzzi approach and engage with the Brazilian market? Particularly, how has the brand leveraged for opportunities in this market, especially following events like today's and our collaborations with you in Brazil last year? Natuzzi is being pretty coherent, I want to use the same word, in developing uh, a brand and market strategy that more or less goes along with the brand identity and the brand vision. So we're not stretching the shape of the brand based on the local needs. Moreover, we're trying to, again, acquire a clear image that will be clear to everyone. So thankfully, our work of evolving Natuzzi Italia into a more interior decoration driven brand, into a brand that is more, let's say, open to involve and bring in and welcome in the design community as a natural source of inspiration for product design, interior decoration. That already started way back in Brazil because I remember when I came 10 years ago in Brazil to launch the Revive Chair, I discovered that in Brazil, like designers and architects are like soccer players in Italy. So I was like, this is unbelievable. Like, you saw, yeah, of course, I only knew maybe Niemeyer back then, but I discovered so many people that were really, really celebrities. And I also understood that there is rarely final buyers and consumers to walk in a store and buying the product themselves because there's always an architect being in between and curating the whole presentation, the whole project. So for us that, you know, we arrived in Brazil already 30 years ago, producing in Brazil, my father always said, no matter how tough it was, and it has been, 
to grow in Brazil. My father always said, you know, we got listed in New York in 1993. We are Italian, Apulian, but half of, we have a, an American leg, okay? If our body would be, our brand would have a body. But my father always said that in Brazil, he felt the same energy that he felt in America in the 80s, in the 70s, and in the 90s. And so this is why we kept on believing in this beautiful country. Thankfully, design is very much appreciated. So our efforts to be relevant in the design world is most likely touching the pencil of these beautiful souls that represent the design community in Brazil. Although I hope and my dream is that tonight this room is populated not only by beautiful Brazilian faces, but also by other people that will keep on feeling how passionate we are about this dream and how serious we are about our mission. So thanks again for your time tonight to listen to this colorful yeah. uh, person. So, if we have time, mm -hmm. why don't we ask some questions? Okay. Be great, because yeah. we have Fabio and Ron and PJ and myself. Someone have, has a question. Eu queria perguntar a respeito da inteligência do tempo, a inteligência coletiva, né? Ou os it guys, que é o espírito do nosso tempo. É o que eles e o pai do PJ vê daqui para frente, pós-Covid, pós uma série de coisas que a gente tem visto pelo mundo, como guerras e etc. Linkado a questões que a gente tá vendo aqui em Milão, mas que a gente também pode ver na Escandinávia, ou na, na Escandinávia, ou na Ásia, ou no próprio Brasil. Nesse sentido, realmente, da coletividade do mundo na área do design. So she wants to know how do you see and your father how is design going to act because of like the world's collective intelligence you know like everybody gathering and having the same information we have like Scandinavian design Italian design American design but like how do you see this world like post pandemic especially how things will evolve I will use um, a word that I, I know someone was pretty critic about, but I firmly believe in it. To me, it's not about design or product. Beauty is a result of design thinking and making if it works right. But to me, what will make a difference is the narrative design. How narrative and storytelling and through inspiration can represent the product design in itself. How can that inspiration boost the presentation of a product itself with an environment that elevates the inspiration itself. How can communication, AI, static, physical and digital, but really bring the message stronger and stronger to the audience? So this concept of narrative design to me will be crucial in making every project, every design relevant, special, and possibly coming, losing all of these leaves of whatever flag and tag we want to put on design, modern, contemporary, Italian, Brazilian, but simply a product and a project and a design that will tell a story. So we believe in storytelling and in design that can tell a story. And we feel that possibly that in the near future and in the present that we believe in will be bold, will be real. And people need to feel real things, real stories, because... There is too much, I personally hate AI because I feel it's so fake. I like roughness. I like something that can make mistake, you know? Human. And uh, it's human and uh, our stories are human and our design will be human for humans. And so we will keep it real. More questions? My screen. Hello. Well, to be very honest, I did not know about Natucci until today, until I met Karim. <laughs> and the way you speak, PJ, about it, I love it. Like that passion, you're transmitting it 100%. So just like a quick uh, clap, because I think this is amazing. Thank you. So as we talk about beauty and how design is changing and AI and democratization of design, right? Because now the process of creation is just easier. Since we have legends that have created for a long time, I want to understand how your process in creating has changed, if it has changed with these tools that are being provided. And if we have time, I would also open, like to open the debate between art and function or art versus design. I think it that's sounds for like you. we don't have time for that. <laughs> <laughs> There was a great book, I think Ralph Kaplan wrote it back in like 72 or something about, it was art versus design question mark that I think I was 12, 13 years old when I read it. There's a lot of, how can I say, so much discourse about it. Design in a way, the word came from industry, right? 
So it came out of the Industrial Revolution. We forget this sometimes, but design was a social act. It was this idea that a company would produce machinery to mass produce goods that were affordable to the majority. That's design. And it, people can argue with me to, to forever, but that's really what design is. But design over time, as the definition has been twisted and distorted and compounded, you know, like across from me in New York, there's, you know, design pizza, you know, and onward and onward, right? And a lot of people think when they're designing also that if they just imitating or copying, they're still calling it design too. That's not design either, right? Because design is, again, sort of based on your criteria and finding the ultimate, the best solution for that given problem. Back in the old day, design was what everybody talked about. It was problem solving, right? Then we got to the point where we started to believe we solved all the world's problems. Well, we obviously haven't. So design is about designing systems, designing materials, designing uh, virtual space. Design is just omnipresent as touching and shaping the, all of us as human beings. The perversity that's happened in design, I find, I'm very critical of this. And we're not talking about art and we're not talking about craft. I'm not talking about these things. You see a way a car is made today, this design, no question about it, on every level, the production method, the robotics, all those things. So I'm not talking about that end because a lot of people start to argue that even the handmade is design. I would question that somewhat, you know, too. So that's what design is. But we can all find a place in this world where we want to position ourselves. So let's go back to your question, okay? Design, if it's here, it's here for us. We are at the epicenter of all of it. Sotsa, Satori Sotsa said to me, how many years ago was that? A long time ago, 40 years ago. We were lying on the beach in Sorrento. Of course, I was supposed to be studying. This was my graduate program. I lied on the beach with a Tory, I don't know, for three months. And he would look at every girl, check out every woman, tell me, what do you think of her? I was like, oh, she's cute. What do you think of her? This is my education. Nothing in this world needs to exist, period, if it's not for us as human beings. And I thought about, I was trying to figure out what he meant by that, you know, that I realized that you could make a beautiful poetic thing that can resonate with you. And we project meaning on things. Things don't have meaning. So a wedding band is an interesting example. What's a wedding band? 18 karat gold piece, that's it, around your finger. But we project meaning on it that it has so much to us personally. So I thought over the years about what he said. I started to see the things in front of me and the things around me. And I started to question are a lot of these things bringing us some sort of meaning? Are they contributive to life? And you can argue that from a painting to a sculpture to a... So with that, I started to like look around the world. I started to realize how much decoration and superfluous things there are. What we call design a lot of times is just decoration. In fact, a lot of what we call designing, the act of designing is styling, not really designing. We're sort of placing things. And so moving f forward... And your question to PJ too, and I'll answer yours too. When you look at all these technologies and all these things that come into our daily lives, if one is curious as a designer or a creative, they will immediately embrace all of these technologies and use them and use them as tools for a betterment, for betterment of their own work and a betterment of what they put out and contribute into the world. I even just watched Ron pulled out his iPad to show Fabio what's in the fair. And this sort of seamlessness of that we are using and embracing these things to kind of shape and contribute is sort of an, I think, inevitable evolution of humanity. Uh, uh, thank you, everybody. Grazie mille. Obrigado. <laughs>